Father God, we receive this charge today that, Lord, we are a people that are at war in a spiritual battle. God, that you have given weapons that are beyond anything that we can touch or see. That you've given us power and authority over our thoughts and, Lord, even those in the demonic realm. We ask, God, that you would come and speak to us as the Lord of hosts. That you would come, Lord, and build up our most holy faith that you would show us in areas where we're ill-equipped because we haven't taken hold of what you've already given us. We invite you, God, to come and speak today and have your way in this place. We love you, Father. We bless you as our King. In Jesus' name we pray. And Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 7. For the last couple weeks, we've been looking at a leader by the name of Joshua and a group of people that were admonished by the Lord himself and said that every place that the sole of their feet would tread upon that he had given them, that from the wilderness to the Lebanon, as far as the great river Euphrates, that God had given them a land to possess. He said, inside this land, you're going to find Hittites and Pezzarites and all kinds of ites that you're going to have to get rid of. You're going to have to take authority and charge over. Man, isn't that just like our walk with Jesus? You get saved and you go on the honeymoon and all of a sudden you find out reality slaps you right in the face. In the same way, it's kind of like when we walk with Jesus, we find that we have challenges right out of the gate. And these challenges many times, if not most of the time, is right between our two ears. The Apostle Paul speaks of this battle of where the strongholds exist In Romans chapter 7, where he writes concerning, I believe, the very same battle. Here in verse 14, you know the text. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do that, I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find this law that is evil present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into a captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched Man that I am. Stop there, may have your attention. Did I just read about you? How long ago was this written? This was about me. How did this happen? It's that sinful nature. Man, the things I want to do, I feel powerless to do them, but the things I know aren't right. I know. For some reason, I just keep doing it. There's a law, there's a war waging inside my mind. This battleground. I I know what's right. God's law shines light on truth, and it also shines light on what's dark, and it exposes it. According, that's the standard. That was the whole point of the Ten Commandments. I can see that by what God says and who he is, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me? Who will deliver me from this battlefield that I'm in, this minefield that I have no chance. Can you imagine being in the middle of a minefield, but you can't see that, and you know by taking one step, you lose your leg. You're just, you're froze. 
I don't know what to do. And many times that's where we come to in this battle, in this walk, even in this Christianity. It's like, I, I just, I've messed up so many times. I've blown it. I feel like such a hypocrite. I just feel like giving up. You ever feel like, I'm going to take time off from walking with God because I feel so discouraged. I need a break from Christianity. There's a reason why, and we'll get to that. But the Apostle Paul cuts to the chase in the midst of this really scary picture he paints, and he says here, oh, man, verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, man, Jesus is the answer. He's the one who gives me victory in this minefield, mind field, if you would, that I just don't know where to step or how to step. And when I try to, where I think I, I need help, but Jesus paid the price. He said it's finished. He won hell and death for me. Oh, thank you, God. See, Romans chapter 8, I love the way this chapter ends. Romans 8, verse 33, it says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? We know the answer to that. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more, underline that word, will you? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's powerful, isn't it, man? You see, right at the end of this incredible chapter, hopefully you got addicted to Romans 8 this week, right? Man, oh, man. At the end of this chapter about this life in the Spirit, it goes to say, I want you to know, believer, you know, the one that has this battle going on, you are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. More. God was trying to tell Joshua and his people you are conquerors. Be bold. Be courageous. Know that the enemies before you, those that look like giants, they're just little grasshoppers. They're bread for you to consume. Don't walk in fear. Realize that you're a conqueror. And I find it incredible, the parallel that we see in the story, in the life of Joshua and the Israelites, and the book of Romans. See, the book of Romans starts off with life in the Spirit. Look at verse 1 with me. It says here, there is therefore. Now, we know why that's therefore, right? We just talked about a battle that was going on, the law against our mind and this this war that was waging. It says here, because of what Jesus Christ did, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Check it out. If you're going to enter into a battle and you're going to take authority over the enemy, you're going to take authority over a thought life and call down strongholds, you have to, as we looked at Joshua, you have to bury Moses and follow Jesus, right? We're going to not, we realize that we're not under the law anymore, the flesh, we're in the spirit, grace. So in the same way Joshua and the people of God, they're going to enter into the promised land, that abundant life and call down strongholds, you see the parallel. It's almost like Romans 8 and, and, and Joshua chapter 1 are just put together. Man, we have to leave the law behind. And when we do that, we'll find that we're more than conquerors. But there's something right smack in the middle. When a person comes to a place to say, you know what? I trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. He's the one who's atoned for my sin. He's the one who's given me the victory over the flesh and the law and death. I'm more than a conqueror. What takes place? A relationship with God, an intimate relationship via the Holy Spirit. See, Romans chapter 8, it starts off saying, hey, in this battle, you have the victory all because of grace, long as you're not walking according to the flesh. In other words, if you start walking back under the law, you will walk defeated and discouraged in your Christianity. Christianity is one big drag when you walk in the flesh, isn't it? I was happier smoking dope. Seriously. 
I've been under the law before when I kind of went back. I was bewitched like the Galatians. Man, honeymoon with Jesus and then walk back in the flesh again. While he's not condemning me, I seemingly sense condemnation because I've walked back in the flesh. But when we walk in the spirit, bury Moses, bury the law. I'm walking in the spirit. Then I sense and I experience I'm a conqueror. The Hittites are grasshoppers. But see, there was something in between Joshua 1 and Joshua 3 or excuse me, Joshua 4 and 5, when they actually take down Jericho, start breaking down strongholds. In the same way, there's something in between Romans 8 and Romans, the last part, chapter 8, verse 33, where it talks about this incredible victory, and it's a relationship with, you ready, the Holy Spirit. Now, see, when we say Holy Spirit, many times people freak out because they go, Holy Spirit, no, I've been to Holy Spirit churches. That's where they jump around and freak out and foam with the mouth and shake and do all that. And and I'm not into the Holy Spirit church. Someone lied to you about who the Holy Spirit is. And, And maybe even someone misrepresented to you who the Holy Spirit is. See, you can't walk in victory. You can't walk in warfare and experience your weapons and call down strongholds without a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You, you, you can't. See, that's why in the middle of this chapter, look with me here at verse 10 of chapter 8, Romans. It says, If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you will put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear. In other words, I'm worried about God will be upset with me if I don't live right, if I don't do the right thing. You're not under the law anymore. God delivered you from that when you accepted Christ as Savior. Somebody say thank you. That's a gift, isn't it? Oh, man. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Daddy. (laughs) I love it. We can talk to God and say, Daddy. Verse 16, the spirit himself, not itself. It's not the force from Star Wars. It's not 220 volts in an outlet. He's a person. He's the manifest presence of God himself, the divine nature, and he lives inside you, and he cries out, and he bears witness, check it out, verse 16, with your spirit. See, when we say, I asked Jesus into my heart, it wasn't the incarnate Christ. It wasn't the second part of the Trinity, God the Son. Otherwise, you'd have a leg sticking out of your chest, right? So how does God live inside you? By his yeah, he lives inside you. See, the relationship with the Holy Spirit is what gives us that partnership and an access and a boldness. It removes fear. It sheds abroad the love of God in our heart where faith replaces, it actually removes the fear. And we're able to walk in a boldness where we see things that before looked impossible to overcome, but we go, I'm an overcomer. I'm a more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. How do we know that? It's the Holy Spirit bearing witness in us. But see, the thing is, there's Christians today trying to live the Christian life without the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. Now you go, well, Dave, uh, doctrinally I have a real problem with that because you can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Now that's true. Once you get saved, the Spirit of God comes inside you. See, Jesus talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. And see, it's incredible In John chapter 14, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he said, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with or para alongside you and will be in you. So he's talking to the disciples. He says, hey, the Holy Spirit, he's with you. He's the paracletus in the Greek for you Bible students. He's the one that comes alongside you and taps you on the shoulder where you even sense this is right, this is good, I'm drawn. It's the Holy Spirit. He chooses us, we don't choose him. And he draws all men unto himself. Jesus said, if I'll be lifted high, I'll draw all men unto myself. How does he draw? Through the Holy Spirit. 
And he says, if I go, I'll send the comforter. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. See, when he, Jesus died and he rose, and shed his blood, he rose from the dead, and he appeared to the disciples, those whom had experienced the Holy Spirit with him that he promised would be in them, right? In John chapter 20, after he appears, it says in verse 21, he said, peace to you. Why? Because they probably didn't have a lot of peace. Their whole world had been turned upside down. So here Jesus appears and says, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Does that take you back to Genesis, right, where he created man and breathed, that same word in the Hebrew for breath or spirit? So he breathed into Adam a physical body. Now he's breathing in a spiritual body, something eternal. And he breathes on them. What does he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. At that point, the blood had been shed. They can believe upon the name of Jesus Christ and the divine nature of God came to live inside them. A lot of Christians experience that, but check it out. That's where they stop. In other words, their cup is full. Their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, just as it was with the disciples. The blood had been shed. Jesus had rose from the dead. They believed on the name of Jesus and received the Holy Spirit. You would think, okay, so we're done, right? We're good? Not so. That's why Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1, look at this, but when you you shall receive, as they had not received something yet, right? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, what? Say it with me. Upon you, and you shall be witnesses, or martyrs. Hey, there's an encouraging word. (laughs) Yeah, that's a whole other Bible study. And you shall be martyrs to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Well, that can be confusing. Wait a minute. The Holy Spirit was with me. That's why I heard Jesus say, come follow me. And I could drop my nets and Matthew could drop his cash. And they just dropped everything and followed him because the Spirit was just drawing them, right? But now the Spirit of God's come inside them. Now, you would think after they got saved in John 20, they would go evangelizing. Instead, they went fishing and caught nothing. That's a lot of Christians today. I got saved. and what, So how's your walk been for the last year? Oh, I really haven't caught anything. Well, what happened? Well, I don't know. I, I walked forward. I prayed. I cried. I, I sensed his presence. And, 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 you know, I believe. But I don't know. My walk's kind of lame. Maybe the Holy Spirit that was with you, you came to Christ. Maybe you received, but you haven't received that power from on high. If you would, your cup was full. It just hasn't overflowed. It just hasn't happened. Because why? Because you're trying to live by the grace of God and by the law. That's why. That's what happens. See, some of you here going, come on, Dave, talk to me, because you, you're, you're speaking to me. I love Jesus, but my, my walk is lame, and, and I do really feel like a hypocrite at times, and I lack the passion I see other people have and spiritual gifts. I, I wanted them, but I didn't receive them, so then I listened to John MacArthur, and I would just bought into the doctrine that it doesn't exist today, and I did that to justify, really, my lack of pressing in and believing. But the reality is I'm, I'm jealous, and I, I feel like a second citizen in the kingdom. You're not, but you probably feel that way. Why? Because you're under law still. I feel condemned. You're not, but you feel that way. Why? Because you're not walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh. There's no relationship. He, he's in you, but he sure ain't overflowing. When the people of God, Israel, was delivered from Babylon, they were freed, and Joshua, the high priest that we read about last week, had Zerubbabel, the governor, and they head out to rebuild the temple. You know the story. Incredible. Here they have a call to go build the temple, kind of like us, right? We are the temple of God, and, and we're growing as this temple's being built. We have strongholds here that are being cast out. There's a work to be done. And when God speaks to his people in Zechariah about this building of the temple, he gives this incredible vision in Zechariah chapter 4, powerful vision. It says, the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who wakened out of his sleep and said to me, what do you see? So I said, I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it and on the seven lamps with seven pipes and seven lamps, two olive trees are by it, one on the right bowl and the other on its left. 
So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? In other words, you should. I said, No, Lord. And he answered to me, This is the word to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, the commander of God's army, speaking to his soldiers as they were building the temple, says it's not by your power or your might. A lot of Christians hear about the Holy Spirit, and they're like Zechariah going, I don't understand. What's the lampstand? What's the oil? What does this mean? You should. A lot of Christians, Holy Spirit, anointing, manifest presence of God, power. What is that? What does that mean? You should know. You're trying to build in your own strength. A lot of Christians today find their identity and their validity and their satisfaction in intellectual achievement through, well, I know that word in the Greek, I know it in the Hebrew, or I've done this, or I've been on missions trips. It's not about you. It's not about anything you can do. It's about what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you and check it out through you, okay? If you want to walk in victory, if you want to follow the Lord of hosts, if you want to see a powerful anointing flow through you, then you have to do what the disciples did. You have to do what Joshua and Israel did because they're synonymous. Look with me at Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. Now, we're going to do something a little unorthodox here, unusual, which we never do anything unusual at Reveal Fellowship. We're completely normal and predictable here. That was a funny joke. (laughs) Well, instead of starting in verse 1, we're going to go ahead and take a look at verse 9, and we'll come back to verse 1. As they are preparing to cross over the Jordan, verse 9, it says, Joshua said to the children of Israel, come here. And hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this, underline that, by this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will drive and out, out the, before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Pezzarites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Stop there. Check it out. As they're getting ready to cross over the Jordan, There's a message that the word of the Lord, the Lord of hosts comes and says, by this, you will know that it is he who will drive out your enemy before you in this promised land. So many people think the promised land is heaven. No, the promised land that's paralleled and shadowed here in the Old Testament is our life right here. Okay? This abundant life we're supposed to be having right now. You don't have to wait for heaven, man. Heaven on earth. Amen? Amen? Okay, we're supposed to be experiencing this. And it says the only way you're going to really experience victory in the promised land, in this abundant life, is the Lord going before you and driving out your enemies. And you'll only know this by this. What's this? Understand the history of the people of God. Remember, we talked about this the first week. We had Egypt, sin. We had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of our heart. Death passed by, judgment's gone, because we believed that the blood that was shed was sufficient to pay the price for our sin. It passed us by, and God delivers from Egypt, and then we did what? We got baptized. We walked through the Red Sea, a picture of the baptism, identifying with the lamb who died and was buried and rose again. Somebody say amen. Amen. And then we walk through the desert. We go through fiery trials to test us, just like they did. But before they ever see enemies driven out, there's something that happened, and it was called this. You know what it was? It was their second baptism. Their second baptism. See, this whole type of terminology and doctrine I know can get controversial, and and it shouldn't be. See, whether you want to call this experience the second blessing 
the baptism of the Holy Spirit, being filled as a spirit, as, as the Apostle Paul commands us to be filled with the Spirit, controlled. It's all semantics. I really don't give a rip what you want to call it. Just get it. Walk in it, okay? What you can't ignore, it, no matter how you want to try and, 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 and place Scripture and move verses around, you can't ignore that the disciples clearly had an experience where the Holy Spirit came in them, and then weeks later, the Holy Spirit came upon them. It was a different experience, wasn't it? You can't argue that. And even in the Old Testament of shadows and types of reality of our life, we see the same pattern. Salvation, Egypt, Red Sea, water baptism, trials, and then there was a period of time of pressing in and purging ourselves of love for Egypt, and then we cross over the Jordan. There's a lot of Christians that haven't crossed over. They've experienced salvation. Man, they got baptized. They've been going through trials. But man, Christianity is just one whew to them. This is hard walking with God. It's because you're mixing flesh and spirit. No wonder it's difficult. Try putting gas and water in your tank of your car and see how you drive. That's what we do, putting flesh and spirit in our temple. It's like, hey, that's what some Christians are like. Like, I love God. Hey, they look like they're epileptic or something. It's like, what are you doing? They haven't crossed over. Jesus said, I want you to wait. Now, in Acts chapter 2, man, I love this Bible verse. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly they came as a sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Stop there. It filled. Can you imagine what that was like? The disciples are there. Their whole world has been rocked. And check it out. Now, no doubt, they watched the blood of the Passover lamb be shed. They saw the risen Christ. Promises are being fulfilled. But it's still all these people that were there at Passover, not Pentecost, that killed Jesus and want to kill them, still want to kill them. Life is not good. Business is not good. It's challenging for them, right? But they are doing what? Just what Jesus said to do. Wait. Wait upon me. I have something for you. I have something special. The Spirit of God is going to come upon you with para, alongside, in, or that word epi that means distribution, our complete commitment. It's a deposit. And then this word, oh man, upon. It, this word, it's, it's an empowerment. And I, some people go, it's a one-time thing. No, I don't think it's a one-time thing. I think it's something we seek every day. Lord, overflow. I want to, because you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You know that. And all of I mean, that's why Ephesians chapter 4, listen to this. It says that we should be putting away lying. Let each one of us speak truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one body. Be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give the place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed from his mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. And grieve, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Dave, what's that have to do with what we're reading? Everything. We're just reading here that this, we're going to unlock a couple keys here. Do you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you want the Spirit of God to overflow through your life? It's not as complicated as you might think. See, if you're not overflowing, there's a good chance that it's because you're grieving the Holy Spirit. That's why your cup is not running over. See, when he talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit, he says, but make sure you don't grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? What would, what would cause us to experience a time of we're saying, I want to be filled, I'm waiting on you, I'm crying out to you, but nothing's happened. What's going on is there's a bitter root and there's a division in his body. That will quench the Holy Spirit. In the same way, when there's a complete unity and a like-mindedness are what we just read in Acts 2, one accord, now the Holy Spirit rushes in. 
That's why Psalms 133 says, oh, I love this. How good and pleasant it is when brother dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the edge of his garments. Incredible scripture that implies, man, when there's a unity in the body, there's an anointing that flows from the head of our priest, Christ Jesus, upon the body. But what happens first is the father says, I see a unity. I see a like-mindedness. I see ability to care more about relationship than who's right about that Calvinism issue. I see a desire to care more about loving one another than holding their sins against them, but forgiving them like God and Christ forgave you. And when you do that, then you don't grieve the Holy Spirit, and then the rushing wind rushes in. What was going on in that upper room? Could it be a matter of that we're releasing judgment? Possibly. Could there be anyone in that crowd of approximately 50 people that could have looked at Peter and go, how could you deny our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter? I heard you do it. And you, you walked away from the Lord. You abandoned him. They had to let go of judgment. They had to let, you know what? We're all filthy, treacherous sinners deserving of hell, but by the grace of God, we've received the Holy Spirit. And we've been grafted in. The two have become one, Jew and Gentile. Man, we're one in Christ. Oh, the way Christ forgave me, I forgive you. It says they were all in one accord. And I find this incredible in Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, how this whole entering into the Jordan starts off. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from the Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. Check it out. In this shadow and type of a second baptism, the people of God, before they're going to cross over the Jordan, the spirit-filled life, it says they were all together. Doesn't that sound like Acts chapter 2? There's a witness going on of something that's supposed to happen within three days. Does that sound familiar? (laughs) It's like we're reading the New Testament or the Old Testament, isn't it? Don't you love this big love letter from God? I I don't want to call it the Old and New Testament. I just want to call it God's Word, you know? It's just because when I'm reading the Old, I see Jesus all over it. I see the Holy Spirit all over this book. I see the resurrection of Jesus Christ right there. I see also a clear picture that if we're going to cross the Jordan and enter into the second baptism and be empowered by this to watch the enemy driven out by the presence of God, that we have to be a people that says, you know what? We need to be together. Why do you think there's such a big emphasis on not gossiping and slandering in the Bible that if you have a problem with someone, Matthew 18, you go to them and you resolve it. You drop your gift at the altar. You don't let division take place in the body because it grieves the Holy Spirit and that's what creates dead churches. Do you know that? That's what destroys a church. That's what chokes the life out of it. That's what stops up the candlestick from burning the flame and that oil, that precious Holy Spirit burning a flame and casting light and passion and vision and healing and miracles. It's because we're so busy loving an institution instead of loving Jesus. We're so busy about our agenda versus, Lord, what do you want to do? And we bring it into this place, and, and, and something's not right. What is it? We have to stop, and we have to wait. What was taking place in that upper room? They were, they were thinking about their lives, guys. They were thinking about everything had changed, and they're thinking about their future and realizing outside of Jesus, there is no future. There is no hope. There is no career outside of Jesus. There is no safety outside of Jesus. There's nothing. I am nothing without him. They had to come to a place of complete, reckless abandonment to the will of God. It took a lot for them to get there. I mean, the sons of thunder, they they had a lot of energy and ideas about what they could do for God, didn't they? They had an idea that, man, somehow they could help God out in his mission to usher in the kingdom. So much so, man, we're just going to help you usher in the kingdom, the physical realm, and overcome Rome. They didn't get it. A lot of Christians today aren't getting it. They think their Christianity is a means of just release of guilt. That's not what it's about. That's not why we're here. 
We're here to be agents of light. We're here to be people who follow after the Lord of the host, and people that experience the promised land. See, if you're back in Romans 7, you need to enter into Romans 8, family. Too many believers living back in Romans 7. Man, I want to walk with Jesus. I, I want to be able to worship. I want to prophesy. And in that ch- Acts chapter 2, didn't it say they all started filled and started speaking with other tongues and all that stuff? No, that, that kind of stuff scares me. Why? Why? Because people weird me out. Well, I, that, that I get. There's people that weird me out too, you know. But that has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with who the Holy Spirit is. So don't fill the baby out with the bathwater, okay? If God's word says he has something for us, then don't shrink back. Don't be like the people of God 38 years prior to Joshua 3 who looked at the promised land and says, oh man, we're scared. We're scared of the giants and we see Jericho and we hear about that they crucify people on the walls and we're, all, we're, we're just, we would rather walk around in the desert and die. And that's the way a lot of Christians are. Well, you know, the whole spirit filled life, and then I, but it says that the power of God comes upon me that I'll be a martyr. That means I'll become one of those crazy Jesus freaks. And what if my wife leaves me like history implies Apostle Paul's wife left him because he was a nut for God? What if I get so radical for Jesus that I lose my job? What if I get so radical for Jesus that? that he calls me into the mission field. Oh, no, oh, my, lions and tigers and bears. What am I going to do, <laughs> right? And a lot of Christians are like that. And the thing is, subconsciously, they know, they go, it's that Holy Spirit thing. It's that Holy Spirit thing. I, I, I'm just going to live with him in me. But this whole thing upon me and overflowing and saturating and drenching me and, and drenching people around me and all that stuff, I, I, that's scared. I'm uncomfortable with that. Who gives a rip what you're uncomfortable with? Seriously, I mean, think about this. If you've been crucified with Christ and you will no longer live, there's a contradiction in that kind of mindset, isn't there? It's not about your life. See, Peter, James, John, the boys, Mary, Martha, all them, they're going, you know what, it, it's, it doesn't really matter what happens. It, it, our lives are over with. The only life we have is in Christ. Now, it was pretty easy for them to do that because no one was going to buy or sell with them or help them because they were outcast cult members. You know, they were on Jim Jones and Island drinking the Kool-Aid in everybody else's eyes, right? That's how they were looked at. So they, in one sense, they had it a little easier than you in the context that they really had nothing else and nowhere else to go. You, my friend, well, you've got a bank account, a nice house, a career, you know, a cush little compartmentalized Christian life where I go to church on Sunday and I party hardy on Monday, and you got it all set together, right? That's not Christianity, and there's no power in that. And it's an open door for someone to be deceived to think you're even saved and might not even be saved. There's that category within that group of people. It's not a good place to live. It's better just to be completely surrendered and abandoned to the will of God. And what's his will? That you would not only have the Holy Spirit living inside you, but a Holy Spirit upon you. And whatever happens, he promises to be with you. He says, and, and I love the rest of this chapter. I wish we had time to dive into the whole thing. It is incredible. But it says here, In verse 13, it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of your feet of the priest bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters shall come down from upstream, and they shall stand in a heap. The Jordan River, understand that today it's something like it was back then. I mean, it's like 100 foot wide today at at tops, but back then in season, And that's what it was here in the season. We're talking about a mile wide and 40 feet deep. A contendable river. And it is a matter of you've got 3 million people that have to cross it. This is going to take all day. And it says, this is what's going to happen. I want the priest, soon as the sole of their feet touch, the waters will be held back in a heap. They're going to look at a wall of water. Wow. Now that's different. Listen closely, Christian. That's completely different than when they got baptized in the Red Sea. When they got baptized in the Red Sea, they stood there and the waters were held back. But the Lord says, this is different. The second baptism, you need to put the sole of your foot in the water first, and then I'll bless you. See the difference? There's a lot of Christians going, well, if the Holy Spirit wants to baptize me, then he's just going to have to do it. 
Really? That's what you think? Now, there are people like John Wesley in history who didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a secondary experience to salvation, and yet a couple of little ladies followed him around in his revival tent meetings and prayed for him that he'd get the Holy Spirit. He's like, I already got the Holy Spirit, ladies. What are you talking about? Ends up, he ends up getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, while he had an issue with it doctrinally, clearly his heart was open, surrendered to leave his comfort zone and lay down his dignity. There was something in him that didn't have a problem with going, I was wrong. There was something in him that said, while I'm not comfortable with that doctrinally, I don't understand it, I'm still open to God to do whatever he wants to do. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I didn't even know what the baptism in the Holy Spirit was. I didn't have a clue. I, I'd just been saved for a year, and I'm sitting there, you know, praying for someone to get saved at the end of a service, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God falls upon me, and I was wrecked. I was a mess. Oh, a wonderful, beautiful mess. Glorious. It's just because I wanted more. Why does someone pray in the Spirit? Paul talks about they pray with their mind, they understand, but the Bible talks about this relationship with the Holy Spirit in Romans 8 and in 1 Corinthians 14, all initiated in Acts chapter 2, that there's this passion that gets released where you actually pray in the Spirit with a language you don't even understand that's beyond anything your mind understands. I believe it's a powerful weapon in spiritual warfare. Now, we're not going to bring you forward here and anoint your tongues with oil and say, my mama got a new Honda. We're not going to get weird about it, you know? I mean, I say that. I know it's kind of funny, but it, I'm not even a jest. There's some places that get weird about it, and they worship spiritual gifts instead of the gift giver. That's whack, right? We're not about that here. What we are about is saying, if it's in the Bible, I want it. If it's a tool in my toolbox, if it's a weapon in my arsenal, man, what Marine walks up and says, AK-47, no, nah, I don't need that. Grenades, no, nah, I don't need that. I'm just, I'm just going to take my good looks in the front line. That's all, really? I want all God has for me. And if he has an anointing that's going to overflow, then I want to do this. Exactly what he said. What was that? Okay, I recognize that there's something else to overflow, and I need to wait upon you. Now, we're going to have some prayer ministry here in a moment, and we know what we're going to do. We're going to wait upon the Lord. There's some, it would be crazy for us to talk about this and not let the rubber hit the road, and let's say, hey, Lord, I want to call upon you. I want to claim your promises, God. You said it. I believe it. Luke 11, incredible area of Scripture here. Jesus said it. He says, I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open for everyone. That includes Everyone, yeah. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from his father among you, who he will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who? ask so we come and we wait and what do we do we go am i in one accord with your body is there a break in the bone somewhere do i have a bitter root towards somebody do i have judgment have i allowed my tongue to speak slander and gossip do i need to repent of that right now are they even in this room do i need to go ask them to forgive me i, I need to sit and wait i mean they sit there and wait for 10 days in the upper room I'm not going to promise you you come forward and all of a sudden you start praying in tongues. Maybe you do. Far out. Cool. Maybe you just come up and you just spend some time and you weep and you release a bitter root in your heart. And it's part, it's a step. It's a process of you experiencing that. That's great too. Maybe there's a physical healing God wants to do that's connected with a bitter root in your heart. The bottom line is, are we recklessly abandoned to the touch and the will of God in our life? Are we ready to be martyrs? Die for the cause of Christ. And if, if we can't do it inside a building where a bunch of Jesus freaks, we ain't going to do it out there. You see what I'm saying? So we need to take some time this morning and wait upon the Lord. We need to take some time and say, God, I want to just 
get on my knees. I want to humble myself before you. I want to lift my hands. I want to go forward and get someone to anoint me with oil and pray over me that I would receive the power of the Holy Spirit upon high. Many times in Scripture we see that throughout the book of Acts. Someone lays hands as a point of contact. I believe the hand of the Father is upon them, and I pray a release of the power of God with them in the name of Jesus. And at that moment, you know what you do? What, you sense something in your heart, you just start speaking out loud. What do I mean? I mean, just start telling God you love him. Don't, don't, can you imagine being married to somebody and they never express audibly they love you? Would you be okay with that? The Lord's not either. We believe in our heart, we confess our mouth, that's how we get saved. And I'm telling you, we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's a connection, there's a parallel there. You sense a powerful urging and a pressing in your heart, you confess your love and your need and your desire for the Spirit of living God upon your life. You say that, God, I love you, God, I need you. God, I repent of this bitter root and judgment of your body. May you unify me with your body, Jesus Christ. Pray out loud. I don't pray out loud, you need to. In the midst of that, God might give you a prophetic word or something. You go, I didn't even know that Bible verse. Is it a Bible verse? A word of knowledge about someone's life. Man, don't we want to be a people that are spiritual? And it's not going to happen until we put our soul into it. You hear? we got to put our soul into it. If we don't put our soul into it, if we don't put our whole heart into it, if we don't put out in the midst of the river, then we're not going to see the waters held back. We're not going to see a flow of God. That's why Jesus said to Peter, step out. You can't just sit and wait. You have to have a point of contact and an expression of faith. I'm going to ask the prayer counselors to go ahead and come forward right now, as well as the worship team. And listen closely, family. If you're here this morning and this is a little uncomfortable for you, I want to challenge you. If you're feeling that way, pray. God, I'm feeling, tell the Lord. He, he already knows. He's already aware. Just say, Lord, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable with this, and may, but I, I can't help but deny the things we're, that they're, he's talking about are in your word, so give me peace. Just like you spoke to your disciples when they were all freaked out, you came and said, peace be with you. God, I need your peace right now about this. Speak to me. If you're really uncomfortable, you can go hardcore and say, I'm going to get somebody to pray for me and say, I'm uncomfortable with this, and I don't think I should be. Can you pray for me right now? It might be a matter of you, you just want to come forward and get on your knees and just say, Lord, I'm here. This is my upper room right here, this corner. This is my upper room, and I'm sitting here, and I'm waiting upon you, and I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for your voice to come speak to me about how I'm supposed to pray. Romans 8 says that your Holy Spirit comes and intercedes and prays through us. You speak to me with words that come into my mind that I know are you, and I'm supposed to say them out loud, and something powerful happens in the Spirit. If you've already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, hey, how about a fresh one? I want to be overflowing in the Lord every day. And considering we do things that grieve His Spirit, I mean, there's a lot of people, I'm sorry to be so gross, but there's a lot of people that are spiritually constipated. I'm serious. And, they, and, they, and spiritually, they look alike. They, they walk around, they look like it. During worship, you know, Hey, someone gave a lot to Jesus. Oh. You need a catharsis. You need the Lord to come and cleanse you. Let's go before him in prayer and welcome his presence here this morning. Father, we come to you as children, recognizing your promises are true, they're trustworthy. God, you're so good. You're beyond anything we can possibly imagine. You're so giving. You, God, you so love that you gave. And we recognize that you will give the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to those who simply ask in faith. We ask in faith not anything that we deserve or that we've done, but we ask in faith according to grace that it comes because of the blood that was shed, because the three days have taken place and Christ has risen from the dead. We have access to God the Father. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to move in this place, to come in like a rushing wind, to remove all the dirt, all the things of the world, and empower us, Lord, to die, 
to die to self and to live for you. We proclaim this as holy ground in this place. God, we hunger for you. We thirst for you. Only you satisfy, Lord. As we worship the Lord, I welcome you just to come forward, get on your knees, come to a prayer counselor. Let's spend some time in the presence of the Lord this morning.